Not everyone is gonna get pregnant in their first embryo transfer. Sometimes it can take several tries. As their doctor, I get to really become a part of these couples' lives. You weather the storm with a couple. And when they finally are successful, and I truly believe that most patients will be successful, and they finally get that baby that they've always wanted, I don't think there's anything more rewarding as a doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I'm beyond delighted to have Dr. Jenna Tarosi on today. When I saw your article published in December 2021 titled Novel Therapeutic Options for Treatment of Recurrent Implantation Failure, I immediately picked up the phone and I was like, how do I get in touch with Dr. Tarosi to have her talk to us about this? So thank you so much for your time today. Hi, it's so good to be here. Thank you for having me. It sounds like we have so much in common, how we approach patient care to our interest in incorporating new technologies into the work we do with patients. Share with us, like, why did you become a fertility doctor? What drew you to this field? So before becoming a fertility doctor, I was actually a biomedical engineer in what feels like a lifetime ago. And that's really first where I saw how we can use technology to really help and transform people's lives. In medicine, I find the science and really the miracle behind reproduction absolutely fascinating. The research behind fertility and technology and what we're able to offer our patients today, it's constantly evolving. And so I love that I get to use the latest research and technology to help patients conceive. And I think you'll agree with me that it's probably the most rewarding career out there. I would have to agree. I couldn't do anything else. And during your fellowship, I want to talk a little bit about that too. You did some amazing research, cutting edge on genomic medicine and assisted reproduction. Can you explain what genomic medicine is and how it can impact fertility care? So genomic medicine, it's using a patient's own genes, their own genomic information, their information about their genes, their genome to make clinical decisions. We are practicing genomic medicine now every day when we look at things like your expanded carrier screening. We're looking to see are couples carrying any of the same genes that would, if they had a child, could potentially make that child at risk for genetic disease. Some patients who are undergoing IVF, they might choose to genetically test their embryo to look for certain genes or look for chromosomes. That's genomic medicine. And what technologies did you look at in your research? So in my research, I was looking at gene editing technologies. So right now we have the ability through IVF and pre-implantation genetic testing, PGT, to screen for embryos for genetic diseases. So things like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's. So a patient might go through IVF, they make an embryo and you could screen that embryo, see if it's something that they have the disease, if they don't transfer it, if they do have the disease, they don't do anything. Now, these new technologies, it's in the research laboratory, we're looking at ways that we could potentially not just screen an embryo, but also potentially fix a gene. So these technologies include like CRISPR or BASE or prime editing. But it's important to realize that just because we potentially could do something doesn't mean that we always should. So I think there's a lot of ethical considerations, and I was most concerned about the negative impacts or really the unintended consequences of these technologies. Specifically, I was looking at CRISPR and what it happens to the entire chromosome. And I found that if you inject CRISPR into an embryo, okay, and that you're trying to fix the gene, sometimes you actually lose that entire chromosome. Approximately one third of the embryos lost an entire chromosome after being injected with CRISPR. That's not compatible with life. So this reaffirms our understanding that CRISPR, other gene editing technologies, they're not ready yet to be used clinically. And this type of bench laboratory research is so important before we actually ever introduce this clinically. And I get questions about CRISPR all the time because patients think that we might be able to use it very soon. When, if ever, do you think CRISPR will be ready for prime time? Yeah, I think if is the correct term to use because I'm not sure it ever will be something that will offer patients. I really love the fact that we're talking about it because I think patients need to be informed about what the technology is. You know, doctors need to know what it is. Researchers should know what it is and politicians should know about it is too because I think we all need to kind of have a conversation about it before it's something that's ever clinically offered. And how do you approach getting to know a patient or a couple as you begin care? And how does genomic medicine play a role in this? Sure. 
So each patient and couple, they're unique. They have their own story. So before starting, I really like to take a step back and really get to know the patient as a couple and as an individual and kind of seeing what they've been through. This really kind of helps me tailor my therapy or care to that individual. Jenna, I just appreciate all the work that you've done. And I'm just so glad, you know, you're doing this genomic medicine work. And the reason is, you know, I've had patients who've seen me and they even haven't had a basic carrier screen. So for patients to hear that this is stuff that we do just will help hopefully someone advocate for themselves and say, hey, you know, have you applied genomic medicine to my case? Obviously, that doesn't mean CRISPR, but other things like a carrier screen or chromosome analysis if indicated. So now let's get into the novel therapeutic options for treatment of recurrent implantation failure, which, like I said earlier, was published in Fertility and Sterility. So for those who are watching and listening, what is recurrent implantation failure other than a really silly name? I hate the word failure. Don't you agree? I definitely agree. Same thing I think about like miscarriage. I hate that term too. It's miscarriage. It's not miscarry. You didn't miscarry anything. It's a pregnancy loss is what it is. So yeah, I hate using those words failure or miscarry. People really get so stressed out and they individualize everything and they think they did something when really it's not something they did. It's a disease and fertility is a disease. What recurrent implantation failure is specifically when we use that kind of term, what we're talking about is when a woman undergoes an embryo transfer and the embryo fails to stick and it do, you don't get pregnant. And what drew you to this topic? So unfortunately, not everyone is going to get pregnant in their first embryo transfer. Sometimes it can take several tries. As their doctor, I get to really become a part of these couples' lives. You weather the storm with a couple. And when they finally are successful, and I truly believe that most patients will be successful, and they finally get that baby that they've always wanted, I don't think there's anything more rewarding as a doctor. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. Thank you for saying that. There's tears for everybody. <laughs> I know. Okay. I'll gather my thoughts, dry my tears. Okay. Okay. So your paper looked at three treatments, and I want you to walk through each one. Let's start with immune therapies, such as peripheral blood mononuclear cells. What are they? They are a mouthful to say. Peripheral blood mononuclear cells, these are your blood cells. They have mononuclear, meaning one nucleus. Specifically, what they are immune blood cells, like your B and T lymphocytes. Awesome. And what happens in this situation where they're not acting normally, you know, what happens within the uterine lining? Yeah, so typically, if you have something foreign or something different that comes into your body, so think of like a virus or bacteria, your body is supposed to attack it. This is your immune system working to prevent you from getting sick. Now, when you're pregnant, this is also something foreign, something different. But the mother's uterus needs to know not to attack the pregnancy. So when I think about it, I think it's actually miraculous that pregnancies even happen. When you're pregnant, the body needs to have special cells like your T cells that lessen and suppress the immune response. So it's hypothesized that for some women with the recurrent implantation failure, that they're unable to recruit these special cells, these special T cells, and since they can't actually suppress their immune response. And have you found that the intrauterine administration of these cells does improve chances for implantation in these women? Yeah, so it's exciting that there are these now small randomized control trials that have shown better success when we have patients that have inserting their own peripheral blood. So this is your own blood. We're just putting it in the uterus before transfer. Exciting. And I've also talked before on this show about intrauterine platelet-rich plasma, and I've been using it in my practice now more recently. What is it for those unfamiliar with the term? Yeah, so PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. Plasma is the liquid portion of your blood. What happens is that you get your blood drawn. That blood, they centrifuge it, so they spin it really, really, really fast. With that spinning, it'll separate the blood into the different components. And what they're taking is the component has the most platelets. So that's your platelet-rich plasma there. And then in the fertility setting, what we're doing is we're placing that PRP inside the uterus. PRP is being used actually in a lot of different areas of medicine these days too. Some people might be familiar with it from like cosmetic, like what they call the vampire facial. Also, it's very popular in orthopedics as well for joint injuries. And it stimulates cellular processes involved in endometrial regeneration. And what does that mean in plain terms? 
So I tell patients, think about like growth factors. So what the platelets are doing is they're stimulating growth factors. So to help tissue grow and rejuvenate. Which patients do you think are the best candidates for this? So right now I am offering PRP to my patients who have a very thin lining. So sometimes before the embryo transfer, when we're measuring the lining on the uterus, if it's thin, they have done studies that have shown by inserting PRP or patient's own plasma, it's growth factors. So it helps that lining grow. Also patients with recurrent implantation failure. So these patients who have undergone multiple transfers and not got pregnant, that these patients, if we place the PRP before their transfer, have also had better success rates. The third technology you looked at was subcutaneous granulocyte colony stimulating factor. Say that after three shots of tequila. So this is also for treating thin endometrium. How does a thin endometrium impact an embryo's ability to implant? So we think of an endometrial thickness as a marker for endometrial receptivity. So when we transfer an embryo, the uterus and the embryo, they need to really talk to each other. The uterus needs to be receptive, aka receptivity, to that embryo. Studies have shown that when your endometrial thickness is thin, this is associated with lower pregnancy rates. So I tried to describe it to patients as the embryo wants a nice thick pillow of endometrium to implant in. That's a lovely analogy. I might be using that in the very near future. And so does the subcutaneous GCSF actually improve the thickness of the lining? And how the heck does it do that? So there are studies that have shown a thicker lining after injection with a GCSF. The idea is GCSF is in itself a growth factor. So again, we're supposed to be stimulating growth. And what about intrauterine? So I've heard so much more about intrauterine GCSF infusion, not as much about subcutaneous. What about intrauterine administration? So I think for GCSF, the jury really is still out about the outcomes for it. They have been studies that have looked at, just like you're saying, inner uterine or subcutaneous. So do we insert in the uterus? Do you do it as a shot underneath the skin? So the studies, when you're looking specifically, not just at the thickness of the endometrial lining, but for patients that have had a implantation failure. So for your patients, lining may or may not be thick. They may have a perfect lining, but still they don't get pregnant. When they have done studies to look to see, does the intrauterine, putting it right into the uterus, before transfer, does that help? And the studies say no, actually. So the studies have actually shown that GCSF in the uterus doesn't really help. They looked at studies then, what about subcutaneous? What about injecting it? Does that help? There are some small RCTs that shows an increase in implantation and pregnancy rates with that. The next then follow-up question should be, well, why is that? How does that happen? And for right now, we still don't really know. So I think we still need more research, bigger trials, more evidence about why it works and how it works before we really offer it to all our patients. That's why you're here to talk to us about all this research, and we can't wait to hear more about what you learn over the next many, many years. So if someone is suffering from recurrent implantation failure, how do they advocate for themselves and ask for some of these treatments? Yeah, it's really difficult to be a patient sometimes. Keeping up to date, it's really hard. But when you've heard things like this, don't ever feel bad about talking to your doctor about it. You should feel comfortable, be with your doctor. You can ask questions too. Ask if they've heard about PRP, what their experience is, if they're offering it. And if not, then feel free to get a second opinion to somebody who maybe is. And I imagine there are patients out there listening to this that are saying, I really want to talk to Dr. Tarosi about my case and maybe incorporate some of these things. So how can they find you and reach out to you? I practice at Columbia University Fertility Center here in New York City. The nice thing is in this field of telehealth and Zoom, you don't need to just be in the New York City area. I'm happy to always talk to you. So you could always call my office. I'm happy to set up a Zoom appointment and I could act as the second opinion, primary opinion, whatever it is. When you've had multiple transfers before, it's so heartbreaking. And I think you really do deserve specialized care. And sometimes it's nice to hear from somebody that's specifically looking at this and kind of doing the latest research to see what works and what doesn't. Well, I would like to invite you on. Every time you publish an article, I'm going to have PubMed alerts on to send me what you're publishing so that you can come and talk to us again, because this has been so incredibly helpful. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we end our show? No, but thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm planning on being back. <laughs> thank you, Jenna. Thank you.